I got to be honest with you. I don't really care why fish bite, but I definitely care that they do bite. So we're going to talk about bite triggers on this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. I'm Chad Lachance, and you're listening to Fishful Thinker, the podcast. All things fishful, all the time. All right, guys, Chad Lachance here. Thanks for joining in for this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. Uh, This is a subject that's uh, important to me, in my opinion. It's, uh, in my feeling, understanding the subject I'm going to go into today, uh, triggering bites is one of the most fundamental things about being a, a light tackle artificial lure specialist, and that's really... For the last 25 years, uh, what I've really focused on is really more like 45 years, but I don't want to talk about how old I am. I I have really focused hard on being able to get fish to bite in all kinds of scenarios. Consistency is key. And having been a fishing guide for 17 years, uh, you got to catch them every day. You can't catch them on the days they're biting. You got to be able to figure out how to catch at least some of them every single day. And same thing with traveling around filming a television show. You know, we've been filming since 2008. We've filmed everywhere from Alaska to Florida, uh, freshwater, saltwater, every species we could think of. And it, it always comes down to you need to be consistent every time. We have to catch them every time. And personally for me, I, I, I want to fish for satisfaction. At, at the end of the day, before I did it for a living or anything else, I like the satisfaction of tricking a fish to bite which is why I'm not a huge fan of live bait. I don't have any ethical issue against it or anything like that. If, if you want to drown night crawlers for, for trout, knock yourself out. I have no problem with that, uh, none whatsoever. But I don't derive as much personal satisfaction from that. So I look at, at bite triggers as something that if I can refine my skill set with those, I can be very, very consistent. And a bite trigger is basically what, exactly what it sounds like, getting a fish to... Make the decision to go ahead and bite your lure. And there's lots of reasons why a fish would bite your lure. It has nothing to do with the fact that, that they're hungry. That's the obvious one, and we all know that one. And if fish ate all the time, we're constantly eating, we could catch you know, fish all the time. You could go out and throw a night crawl in front of any fish in the lake, and he'd eat it every time. And, uh, but that's not the case. And the reason that's not the case is because they metabolize. They're cold-blooded. They have moods just like you have moods. They have, you know, different reasons why they do different things. And by taking advantage of those, we can be our best in terms of getting the highest number of bites. So when I talk about bite triggers, I talk about ways to get fish to bite other than feeding responses. A feeding response is the easiest one. It's the obvious one. It's the one I don't have to talk much about. But long story short, if you're a fly fisherman and you match the hatch perfectly and you get a perfect dead drift of, you know, that size 20 little pale morning dun, and it drifts perfectly over the top of a fish that's feeding on pale morning duns, and he eats it, that's a feeding bite. And good for you. You made a perfect drift. You got him triggered. But that's not the the kind of bite that I am talking much about here. That's a well-documented thing. Same thing if you're, uh, you know, throwing power bait, which works fantastic without any motion at all, just sitting there. Fish will swim by and get it. That's a feeding response. That's not really what I wanted to talk about in this podcast. I really want to talk more about getting fish to bite that don't want to bite, that aren't actively seeking out something to eat. Because the scientists at Berkeley spent a lot of money to figure out um, in their fish labs in Iowa that um, fish only feed a small percentage of the time. And that's great, but I mean, geez, if we fish 12 hours, that's only a half day, right? So we need them to feed a lot. And in most fish, it's only a couple hours twice a day. It's not a big, giant window that they're feeding all the time. In some cases, they feed more than in others. Uh, Obviously, uh, in a running water situation where fish burn more energy and have smaller things to eat, well, they might feed more commonly versus something like uh, a largemouth bass that might eat a three-quarter pound bullfrog and then not eat again until the next day. His his window for, for being for a feeding bite closed as soon as he ate that frog. That doesn't mean you can't get them to bite. And we've all caught fish with their whole gullets full of other stuff. And so it's not always about feeding, right? So we got to keep that in mind. But the thing is, fish are predatory. And when I say fish, I mean like literally almost all of the fish that you ever are going to fish for. Big fish eat little fish is a real thing. And the, the overwhelming majority of fish are predatory. Yeah, there's some vegetarians, but even those will eat bugs for the most part and, uh, and therefore could be tricked 
for sure. Um, the, the thing about bite triggers is it applies to almost anything you're going to fish for. It could be largemouth bass or trout. Or it could be anywhere in between. So it's really important to keep that part in mind. Bite triggers are, uh, easiest way I think to, to judge bite triggers is if you can see what's going on between you and the fish. So in other words, swallow, you know, uh, follows, swirls, uh, fish that are that kind of roll at your bait and don't get a hold of it, fish that are hooked outside the mouth. Um, you know, there's lots of things like that that will give you clues as to what's going on or no response from fish that you can see. That's a classic one. The fish has no response at all to your lure if you can see them or conversely pulls away from your lure as the case might be a negative response. That's bad. Refusals in general, fish come and looking at your stuff. And I've learned a lot about refusals lately because of the active target, the Lawrence active target that's on my boat for this year, um, man, oh man, I, I find out I get a lot more refusals than I ever realized. They were just 20 feet below the boat and you didn't know that you got refused, but I get a lot more refusals than I realized. So refusals are the best thing. A fish that looks at your stuff and says, no, nah, I'm not doing that. And, uh, or that chases your stuff and says, no, nah, I'm not doing that. So let's talk about some specific bite triggers of how we turn follows and swirls and refusals and ig being ignored altogether into fish to bite. So one of the best bite triggers out there is pure speed. I mean, like how fast can I make a, a lure go? I just got back from Alaska and I got to play with a bunch of pike that you could see. And pike are very good, very triggerable fish, which is why they can be easy to catch. They're very triggerable fish. And it's not always about the fact that they're eating. We, we pulled in a, a little slough and there's pike laying all over the bottom. And they weren't moving at all. I mean, they were just all laying on the bottom. And you could see them all sitting there. And so I threw a bait out there and let it settle in front. I thought maybe I'll get an opportunistic feeder. Kind of like if I put a bowl of potato chips in front of you and leave it there long enough, whether you're hungry or not, you'll probably reach out there and eat one of those potato chips. So first thing I did was put something small on, throw it out in front of one, see what would happen. It got ignored. But it didn't even acknowledge that it was there. So I upsized a little bit and make, make it a little more obvious, right? A little bit bigger bait, let it go out in front of a different fish, same thing. No, no response of any kind. He just sat there and did nothing. And no response is a response, in my opinion. In other words, you didn't do it right. And so you have to learn from that. And once I get one refusal, let me just point this out real quick. If I get a one clear refusal from a fish, I will not make that presentation again. If a fish comes up and he looks at my dry fly and he refuses it, I'm not throwing that same dry fly back to that fish or I'm not doing it on the same drift. I figure that's a waste of time. Yeah, one out of a certain percentage of them will bite it. Um, but if he comes up and gets a good look at it and doesn't eat it or those pike get a look, good look at my, my hard bait sitting on the bottom and they don't bite it, well, then I know something's wrong. Interestingly enough, with those pike, I took a little... A, uh, a uh, Berkeley Power Swimmer, the 4.3-inch Power Swimmer on a jig head and I threw it out and set it let it go down let it sink down in front of one of them the fish were like eight feet deep and he looked at it and nothing 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 so I'm like all right I got it he wants the thing to run from him uh, he's not even looking so basically I just hit the reels hard as I could hit it all in one shot and just started cranking on the handle like that thing took off well the fish it took off away from charged it immediately but before he could even catch up to it another one of them that was laying there on the bottom apparently sound asleep rolled up and smoked it before he could get there and they almost crashed into each other getting a hold of it and I literally was taking the fastest Rebo rocket spinning reel that I have and winding it as fast as I could wind it across the top of these fish on one throw and wham just like that they went and interestingly enough that trigger getting that first one to chase it created scarcity so to speak I, I and I'll get back to that in a second. A second fish came up and smashed it immediately and got him. And he got hooked. I got giddy, pulled it away from him, and didn't, didn't hook him all the way. And as soon as the bait came out of his mouth, a third one smashed it. So now the whole school of pike is sitting there ready to grab anything that came by. So the, the slow, subtle bait didn't trigger anybody. As soon as I lost my patience for that and hit the reel for all I was worth to get the thing back to the boat to see if they would get one of them to pounce, they pounced, and sure enough, that's exactly what happened from then on. So it was a very classic bite trigger right there. It was pure speed, and that can be a, an excellent thing. I didn't change the bait. I didn't change the color, the size, anything else. I just tried to get it away from them, and that's really important. And we joke about I, my camera guy, Tim Farnsworth, and I, he's filmed all my episodes, just about all of them, for 360-some episodes of Fishful Thinker. He, we have spent some time in boats together is a fair statement. Uh, 
I always make analogies about stuff. So one of my analogies is is the lion and the gazelle. The the gazelle runs from the lion, period. The gazelle triggers the lion by running from him. Or an erratic gazelle with a broken leg that doesn't like doesn't run the same as the other ones will be the one he will pick out of the herd. That's the trigger that gets him to go. Same thing with a pigeon at McDonald's. You, if all pigeons are roosting. One pigeon sees a french fry hit the ground at McDonald's, and all the pigeons are now looking for french fries very quickly. Another key, key kind of thing. Speed can be a really good bite trigger, and speed's an excellent one for getting a competitive bite going. Smallmouth bass in sunny weather or peacock bass, for those of you may be listening from Florida, South Florida, peacock bass on a sunny day, Pure speed is your friend. And I'm talking about not a mid-level wind. I'm talking about burn that thing back. If you're a fly guy, I'm talking about tucking the fly rod under your armpit and stripping with both hands like they do for barracudas. And speaking of barracudas, if you've ever been fishing for barracudas, there is no possible way that you can retrieve a bait too fast. But as soon as it slows down, they don't want anything to do with it. The bite trigger is the pure speed. And you got to keep that in mind. So if all else fails and you're not catching fish, there's a good possibility that you maybe need to fish a bunch faster. Uh, I fished with Brent Chapman, a BASS and Major League Fishing Pro. Oh, it's probably been the better part of 10 years ago now. And, um, and we weren't catching very many fish. Water was hot, and we weren't catching a lot of fish in a certain section of the lake, and he's throwing a square bill, a little square bill crankbait. Next thing you know, he takes that same square bill, and he's going as fast as he can wind it now. Instead of doing a nice even retrieve, he's now just got that thing on a straight burn as fast as it'll go. Guess what? Our number of bites, like, doubled. Uh, I have learned that about crankbaits a lot of the time, or jerkbaits. Sometimes pure, faster you go, the more fish you will trigger with it, the less chance to have a look at it, the more it takes a fish that is an otherwise neutral mood. He's not doing anything. He's not negative. He's not put off necessarily. He's just not feeding. Well, then that speed comes by, and suddenly his decision to feed changes a whole bunch. It's kind of like grabbing a, you know, an opportunity before it gets away. It's an excellent trigger. Another uh, excellent bite trigger can be the sudden start or stop of motion. So, in other words, something that's moving real fast. Let's say you're winding that crankbait full speed, and then you stutter the reel for, I mean, like one second, then right back to the reel. Right when that tiny little second happens, your bait doesn't even doesn't really even come to a stop because the rod's got to unload and, and all that. Uh, but you just gives a, a little bit of stutter in its step. Wham, that's when your fish will get it a lot of the time. Uh, and so a little stutter in your paw and your retrieve can be really good. Uh, if you're a bass guy rolling a spinnerbait along, a nice even retrieve is great. If they're feeding, they'll murder that thing left and right. But maybe they're not feeding that well and it's still the proper tool for the job because of the fact of cover or something else along those lines. You need something that's weedless, but you can still retrieve horizontally. Okay, maybe we're going to go with that spinnerbait. Maybe the water's all stained, so I don't want to go with a swim jig. I want something they can find a little easier. Well, putting a little stutter in your reel as you're winding every so often or a tiny little snap on the rod tip, just enough to barely flutter the blades will trigger a lot of your bites. The bites will come right at that time. But being cognizant of that and then doing it systematically is should be part of your pattern. And as soon as something unique happens in your fishing, anything that catches your attention that's unique, you should study that. You should look at that and go, why did that happen? And, and then try to repeat it. One's a fluke, two's a theory, three's a pattern. That's one of my favorite sayings. Any one fish can do anything. Any one fish might act any one way or anything else. But by the time you get two or three of them to do it, you're on to something. And I can tell you that by the time I get three fish to do any one thing, especially if it's very specific, then I'm keyed on that until further notice. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make them make me put that down at that point. So that little stutter in your reel on your spinnerbait might be exactly what the doctor ordered to get them to bite instead of follow it. Uh, same thing with your jerk bait. Your jerk bait, you're working along and just jerk, 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 and the fish is following it, following it, following it. But you don't see him accelerating. He's not decelerating. I try to read their fins, if at all possible, and look and see if I can get a gauge on them uh, of what they're doing. If the fish is slowly gaining on the bait, I'll wait till he catches up to it and then just barely lean the rod tip one side or the other. Uh, if the fish is gaining on it, I will not slow the bait down. If, it, if I'm being followed, you see a trout following the lipless crankbait very commonly. The worst thing you can do is, is pause that bait or, or follow any sort of little jerk bait. The worst thing you can do is pause it. In most cases, you're better to steer it or speed it up. As the fish starts to catch it, just swing your rod all the way from one side of your stance to the other. And in so doing, your lure will change directions 
a certain percentage, depending on how far it is away from you and how long the rod is, that little bit of change in direction will be enough to get the fish to pounce in a lot of cases. And direction changes are something that was kind of developed, at least as I understand it, by swim bait guys. Guys are throwing great big swim baits. And bass love to follow them. Snook love to follow them. Hey, hey, that's a big, slow-moving thing. That's wonderful. But they don't pounce because they're curious about it, but it doesn't really have the bite trigger they need. As soon as it changes directions or speeds up, they'll grab it. As soon as it stops, they'll run up on it, flex on it, and most of the time go away from it. If it swims its way to the bottom, maybe not. But if it just dies in the water column, uh, a lot of times you're going to get refused. But if you have a direction change or a speed change uh, in an increase, you have a good shot at getting fish to trigger. So direction changes can be an excellent bite trigger along with pure speed. If you're getting follows with something that's rhythmic, like a crankbait, it's a constant dump, 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 dump through the water, or an inline spinner that's a very even dump, dump, dump. Maybe you need to switch it up to a much more tap on the rod tip to make the bait be a little less rhythmic, or potentially put it down altogether and go to a bait that's that's naturally um, not rhythmic. I don't know what the opposite word of rhythmic is, but that's rad, you know, naturally... Uh, hunts around on its own of some sort. I think that's part of the reason things like bladed jigs became so popular. Uh, you guys might know them as a chatterbait. There's a bunch of different companies that make them. That's actually a brand name. But the bladed jig is a very erratic bait in and of itself, just winding it along. It never really does the same thing twice. Some of the old school crankbaits that were famous for being so good, the original wiggle words from way back in the day, they had really crappy molding systems and the baits were not consistent and therefore they wouldn't hunt in a straight line and therefore they caught lots of fish. And then anglers in the early days tried to tune that out of them and before they realized that now, these days, guys will give you a lot of money for an old wiggle wart because they are poorly constructed and no two of them run exactly the same. So uh, it's a built-in erraticness that will do that for you. The more rhythmic stuff gets, the more follows I get. That's very consistent. If it's going to be rhythmic, in my mind, it needs to be fast. And, uh, and that's really important. And it needs to look very, uh, with, to some degree, real as well. Because without that, um, the fish are just, it just did no trigger for it at all. One of my favorite bite triggers uh, that I think is, is uh, one that is commonly done, but not people don't really think about it exactly why, is the fluttering fall effect. And so if you're retrieving something like a spoon, uh, Johnson Sprite being one of my absolute favorites, uh, I've been fishing those since I was a kid for redfish and, and everything in between, redfish, pike, and, and everything, every, you name it, across the board, little ones, big ones, uh, everybody likes the Johnson Sprite spoon. One of the best ways to fish is vertically up and down that fluttering fall. When it starts falling through the water column, it never does the same thing twice. And that fluttering fall is an excellent bite trigger uh, for all kinds of fish. So if you're getting a fish that's following your bait, just stop the reel in that case, and the bait will immediately flutter, start fluttering to the bottom. Don't lift the rod, anything else. Just stop reeling and let the bait flutter its way down. That can be an excellent way to get fish to go because it doesn't stop in that case when you stop reeling. It just flutters its way down, like it died in the water column, perfect for a bite trigger. Also, I think that's why tube jigs are so popular. And there's an old rigging trick for tube jigs. Instead of stuffing the the tube, the, or the, excuse me, the jig head all the way in the tube, leave a little bit of airspace in the front, like an eighth or a quarter or even more airspace in the front of the tube jig. What that will do, uh, once you tie the line to, to the top of the jig head at that point, is it will increase the amount of spiral you get on the drop, which is very, very similar to the flutter on the drop. A fish that sees something spiraling to the bottom is a very good call. Berkeley made a snap jig, same thing. The snap jig's got little wings on it, and that snap jig will make your bait spiral to the bottom uh, as you, if you drop and slack it out. It will do that. If you keep it on tight line, it will hunt its way back and forth to the bottom. It'll kind of swerve this way and that way and the other way on its way to the bottom. But again, that's if you just keep the line tight and hold the rod in one spot. That's what it'll do. That can that can work really good as well. And if you're vertical jigging it, it's going to turn a different direction every time, similar to the spoon. And therefore, it's an excellent bite trigger. Keep fish from, from just following baits and actually getting them to go on it. Another one is straight snap jigging. The Something like a gulp minnow, that's my favorite one to do. With a 3-inch gulp minnow on an 8-ounce jig head and, and relatively light line, um, let that thing go to the bottom. Let, as soon as it hits the bottom and completely stops, you snap it as aggressively hard. Bam! Snap that thing 3 or 4 feet off the bottom and then follow it back down with the rod tip. So the rod tip doesn't drop any quicker 
then the lure itself sinks. So I've got a kind of a lazy bow in the line following the lure back down. As soon as that bait rolls over at the top, you'll get a trigger out of the fish. The thing it darted for the surface and then it rolled over and got it right, you know, right at the top. It kind of rolls over and heads right back to the bottom and bam, they'll smack that thing right at the top. Walleyes love snap jigs, so do trout. A lot of other fish love that. But you, the key is that how aggressively you snap it off the bottom. If you just pick it up off the bottom with a gentle rod lift, they don't do it as well. They want that hard snap that gets their attention, and then as it rolls over, they'll go ahead and get it. So, and based on that also, I'm sure everyone listening to this, if you've ever been fishing very much, you'll know. You've been fishing, 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 nothing happens. You go to wind your bait back to the boat, now it gets bit. Two things happen. One, you sped it up a whole bunch because now you just want to get it back to the boat or the bank. So you sped it up a whole bunch. So obviously there's one trigger we already talked about. Then two, it's headed for the surface like it's going to get away. And if you've ever seen fish get pushed to the surface, bait fish get pushed to the surface, that's basically between the rock and the hard place for the bait fish at that point. They're stuck up against the surface of the water, and they're easy to get. You ever fish for tunas, wipers, uh, stripers, you know, the quote-unquote boil scenario? They get all the bait fish pushed up to the surface, and that's how they get them. There's a whole bunch of fish whose defensive mechanism, the best of those being the flying fish in saltwater, their defensive mechanism is to leave the water for a period of time. In other words, jump and try to run away from the bait that's, or excuse me, from the predator fish that's chasing them down. So when your lure speeds up and heads for the surface at full speed, any predatory fish that sees that has a good shot at pouncing. And as we've already discussed, almost all of them are predatory to some point. I've even had carp chase a tube jig down that I went to reel back to the boat and grab it right as it broke the surface film. And we're talking about a common carp, a fish that's not necessarily known as an aggressive feeder, and also, just for the record, one of the smartest fish in fresh water, and yet they still fall for the same, the same thing of speed and the fleeing response. Speaking of bite triggers in a little bit bigger picture, here's one that is probably the most fun of all, and in a lot of scenarios, it's, it's I think, in my opinion, overlooked, and second of all, it is something that's more diverse than people give it credit for, and that is just flat being on the surface. I just got back from Alaska, okay? <clears throat> we were fishing for a fish called she fish. You may not be familiar with them. They exist in five drainages in Alaska. Um, they eat baby salmon. They're pretty big. They're anywhere between about 5 and 30 pounds or so uh, where I was fishing them, and there's lots of them in the river, and they're feeding on baby salmon. They're smolt that are coming down the river. Smolt are about 2 inches long, something like that, and they're basically silver, and they were hatched the the spring of the year. They, of course, laid up there last fall of the run, and then they hatch, and they got to make their way down the river into the into the ocean. Well, in so doing, they have to run the gauntlet with all the she fish, and the she fish just absolutely smash them when they get in certain areas of the, of the water. Well, we were up there fishing those she fish, and we could see them that they were feeding right on the surface, so we thought, you know, we'll take a swing at them with a surface fly. One of the guys at Alaskan Adventures Lodge uh, and there's another podcast with Dan Paul, the owner of that place that we have up. If you want to go look at our episode list, um, that you can hear more about that. But we were fishing with Dan Paul from Alaskan Adventures Lodge. Unbelievably cool place on the hood in the river. She fish were busting all around the boat, and they're grabbing smolt that are running under the surface. And you can see the smolt darting around, and they're like anywhere between zero and a foot under the surface. We want to catch them on fly rod. So logically, we said, well, we need a small streamer fly that matches them. Uh, so we fly the same color, same size as the smolt. We're going to match the hash, very classic. And then we're going to strip this streamer back across the surface. If you stripped it slow, none of them bit it. If you stripped it as fast as you could go, a few of them would bit it. But we started surmising between one of the guides, Sam up there, and, uh, and a few of the rest of us and looking at the scenario that, hey, wait, what, time out. What if it's right on the surface? They'll get a good signature of it. And even though the smolt that they're feeding on are not necessarily on the surface, they're definitely swimming under, and they were not jumping away from the sheep fish at all. Um, we would try that. So I took a little tiny surface popper uh, tied by the guy by the guy by the name of Steven Schweitzer, who you, you can look him up. He's written several books, including one on topwater flies. Took that little tiny surface fly. It's a basically an inch and a half long little white popper. Started popping that on the surface, and I was not exaggerating when I say we would get two to five bites on every single cast. If you didn't hook them, you would get bites every time. And unfortunately, Steve had tied that little fly for catching trout based on an episode of Fishful Thinker that he and I did years ago where I caught a bunch of trout on, on little miniature plastic surface poppers. 
uh, and caught him really good in crystal clear water. And he had tied that fly to mimic that. So it had a little tiny hook in it, and it wasn't ideal for hooking 15-pound she fish. In fact, the she fish eventually ruined that hook. But, uh, but the bite triggers were ridiculous by having the little fly right on the surface. And I can't tell you how many times, as a smallmouth bass guide, it can be high, bright sun, fish are 20 feet deep, and they see a walking bait come over the top. My favorite of those right now is the Berkeley Drift Walker. That is a wicked bait for catching smallmouth on the surface. That bait walking back and forth on the surface just puts out a signature that they can't resist. And they'll come darting 20 feet up and blast that thing. So walking bait on the surface for any sort of a bass can be really good call. I've also seen wipers, uh, or, and stripers I should say, at Lake Powell that would not bite a, a bait running a foot under the surface, but would bite everything on the surface. No matter what you threw, as long as it was on the surface, they would bite it. It can be a really good scenario. I've seen uh, cutthroat trout that don't really have never seen anything other than a bug because they're at 13,000 feet in elevation. They might eat a few of their own, but that's it. There's no, there's, the water's borderline sterile. It's clear as glass. They will come a long ways to get a surface popper or a speedy little topwater on the surface, like a miniature buzz bait. You would be shocked at how far a trout will chase a buzz bait on the surface. It's some, it's just a trigger. There's something running on the surface of the water and I had a conversation with John Gearock, uh, famous trout bum, fly fisherman guy, many, many years ago when I was in college. I had to interview him. So I went to his house in Lyons, Colorado, and I interviewed him, and we were talking about it. And I told him one of my favorite quotes from his, from his book when he was asked what, what this fly looked like to a, to a bass in a pond because it was a big, giant, ugly surface fly. And he explained in his book that it, that it triggered prehistoric memories of drowning baby pterodactyls. In other words, no, it doesn't match anything it's just something on the surface that's struggling and looks to be edible, and a high percentage of fish will feed on that uh, very, very well. Along those same lines, just barely breaking the surface film is an excellent call uh, on a bait that's being retrieved. I've seen floating stick baits where, with trout where you jerk it along, duke, 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 and they follow it, and then you pause it, and it floats up, and as soon as it breaks the surface film, they grab it. I've seen that. I've filmed that several times even where they don't bite the plug under the surface. As soon as it breaks the surface film, they bite it. If you slow it down, they refuse altogether. If you just stop and let it break the surface film, float it and break the surface film, they'll get it right away. Uh, so again, it has to do with the fact that it's on the surface more than anything else. And it's not, I mean, they get a better look at it at that point, right? They're sitting right underneath it looking at it and they get it. In fact, we even got one where I had my, I had an eight inch long Jerk bait sitting right next to me on the end of my rod, sitting in the water. I'm standing waist deep in the lake. I'm doing the commentary to the camera, and this big old giant brown trout swims over there and smashed that thing like it owed him money. Literally bit it like a dog with a bone right in the middle of the body of this big giant floating jerk bait that I had, and um, and he just smashed it. The fact that it was floating there on the surface was here's something big and floating, and I can eat that. And that would be very good. So uh, being on the surface or creating surface commotion can be a very, very good bite trigger. And most people associate surface fishing with bass or tunas or something like that. But at the end of the day, almost everybody will feed on the surface. Trout, very good. We've, we've been experimenting around with the, with the little tiny chopo, which is kind of a plopper style bait. They make one that's only 75 millimeters long, a little tiny one, and you want to talk about getting some explosive bites. It's just a little high-speed ripple thing going along the surface, and, uh, and it creates a ton of, a ton of visible V-wake, and V-waking is a great way to catch fish. Another good example, I had a conversation with Steve Kennedy in a boat at uh, Bull Shoals. I was a marshal for him at Bull Shoals. Steve Kennedy is one of my favorite guys to talk fishing with because he is a seriously fishy guy. He's like, V-Wake is one of your best friends for bass fishing. And, and he's like, he learned it as a striper fisherman with his dad. Um, but that V-Wake, leaving a V on the surface, is a great trigger mechanism for a lot of fish. And it will generate a lot of bites. Stripers and wipers and largemouth and smallmouth bass, both a whole slew of saltwater fish and trout, which nobody seems to think to do it for. Uh, it really works really good. So... At the end of the day, what's most important is that you pay attention and keep an open mind about what triggered your bites. Every fish should teach you how to catch the next fish, every time. So if, if a fish refuses your stuff, he should be able to teach you how to catch the next one because he refused and you know you need to adjust something from there. 
Sometimes it's your lure color or your lure size, but whatever. Most of the time, it's your motion. And I'm going to close with this last example. Uh, fishing with Marty the Party Joseph, uh, an extremely pressured tailwater fishery in Colorado. He's like, you know, it's almost impossible to get these fish to bite a dead drifted fly. We're talking 6X tippets, 7X tippets, tiny, stupidly small little flies, and, uh, and they just get refused one after the other. But he skitters them away from the fish. So as soon as if it gets refused one time, instead of changing flies, which is what almost everybody does, maybe makes five casts in a row and gets refused each time, and then they change flies. No, no, no. He puts that thing out there. And as soon as the fish comes up to look at it, just about the time he's fixing to get refused, he just pulls the pulls the fly a couple inches to one side or the other, makes it move on the surface. The overwhelming majority of them that he did that to immediately bit the fly. So from then on. I was paying very close attention, so every time I got within range, as soon as the fish come and started to look, instead of waiting for their fuse, I just tried to pull it away from them very gently to one side or the other, just enough to make it look alive, and lo and behold, they would eat it every time. So paying attention to what triggered your bite or what didn't trigger your bite and making an adjustment accordingly can be really good. So speed, direction changes, erraticness, more speed, uh, a, a high-speed head for the surface, or something in the surface film, all are very excellent ways to trigger bites. So think about how you're catching them next time or how you're not, and uh, keep an open mind and try some different stuff and see if you can trigger more bites. If you guys want to join our conversation, we would appreciate it very much on our YouTube channel. That's at Fishful Thinker. Uh, I think there's 520 videos or something up there these days, and uh, all of it education-based. Also, Facebook and Instagram, both at Fishful Thinker there. And please, please, please subscribe to this podcast, and we'll keep the intel coming. So thanks for listening, guys. This has been Fishful Thinker, the podcast.